Um, hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Pete Timmerman. I'm the director of the Webster University Film Series. Um, by way of introduction, I wanted to talk a little bit about the film series before I hand the floor over to tonight's speaker, Justin Sevakis. Um, I almost managed to butcher your name right in front of you. After, after I asked you how to pronounce your name, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, so um, we're Saint, the Webster Film Series is St. Louis's only year-round nonprofit cinema. Uh, we've been in existence for 42 years, give or take, um, actually a little bit more. We tend to operate um, in the Winifred Moore Auditorium, which is in Webster Hall on Webster University's main campus in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, we had to close down with the pandemic, as you can imagine, um, so we haven't shown anything in person since March of last year. Uh, we're not expecting to reopen until August of this year, so we've got a long period of uh, dark screen. Uh, but we've been keeping busy in the interim with virtual events. You're, of course, attending one now. Um, but aside from the virtual discussion events, we have been operating uh, virtual cinema where we book the films uh, that we would be booking in person just online instead. It's not an ideal circumstance, admittedly, uh, but still it's a good way to both keep in contact with our audience and to give you the opportunity to see um, like the new films, um, you know, foreign art house, etc. Um, and also restorations of older films that we'd be showing in person in better circumstances. Um, if I'm being honest, the selection of films that I can book for the virtual cinema is starting to become uh, pretty um, unreliable. Uh, we used to have you know, two or three or four in the virtual cinema at any given time. Now it's more like one or two at any given time. Um, as I speak, there's only one film in there. It's a French film called Spring Blossom, um, but it is written, directed, and starring Suzanne Lindon. Um, she wrote the script when she was 15, and she directed it and starred in it when she was 20. Um, and it's a good film. It's not just a curiosity of like, oh, you know, like a young person made this. Um, I, it's a legitimately good film with an interesting perspective. It's, um, you know, coming of age romance type of thing. But like I said, it has an unusual perspective. It's very much worth your time. And then uh, tomorrow we have another film opening in the virtual cinema. That one's uh, Two Lottery Tickets, which is the most successful Romanian comedy that's ever been made. I'm not sure how much competition there is for that title. Uh, Romania is not known for their comedies. I love Romanian cinema, uh, but for the most part, it is not particularly funny. Um, but Two Lottery Tickets was a New York Times critic pick last week. We're opening it tomorrow. So um, yeah, right now you've got one film in there. Next week, you'll and uh, tomorrow you have two films in there. I mean, you can access those films at webster.edu slash film series. Um, also, if you keep an eye on us on social media, we always post the rental links there. On uh, Twitter and Instagram, we're at WU Film Series. And on Facebook, we're at Webster Film Series. So if you want to give us a follow in all those places. Uh, before we get started with tonight's event, I wanted to thank our sponsor of all of the anime with Satoshi Kon uh, speakers, which is Japan America Society of St. Louis. Um, I had this program almost entirely put together, um, and I contacted one of my friends there who um, set me up with a couple of good speakers who I actually started out the month with. Um, but I'm grateful to my friends at Japan America Society of St. Louis for sponsoring this series. Um, so tonight is the last event of the uh, Satoshi Kon series. Next week, we're going to start with Otto Preminger. Uh, Preminger was the director of the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, et cetera. Um, he had a very long career. And there's not a really good way to pin him down because he did excellent work in all kinds of different genres. Um, and also, he made a whole lot of really good films. I only have four Thursdays to work with in June. Um, so we're really just kind of getting like the tip of the tip of the iceberg with him. Uh, but so next week's event is the first of the Preminger series. Uh, that is T.L. Reed on Laura. Um, Laura is, of course, the classic film noir mystery. Um, the AFI named it, I think, the third best mystery ever made. Um, it's actually a co-star is Vincent Price, who is both from St. Louis and today is his birthday. Um, so it would have been appropriate to do it tonight, maybe. But anyway, that's a week from tonight. Um, T.L. Reed, the speaker, is an experimental photographer. Um, he's actually terrific with anime, um, so she would have been a good pick to do this month. Um, she um, has taught film noir at Webster University, among other things, so she'll be a lot of fun on Laura. Uh, two weeks from tonight, which is June 10th, we have Renee Thomas Woods, who teaches uh, communications and mass communications at St. Louis Community College at Flow Valley. She was also my boss for a long time. Um, I, I was an adjunct under Renee for a period of, I think, over 10 years. Um, but she's going to talk about Carmen Jones, um, Preminger's adaptation of the Bizet opera Carmen. Um, it was the one that Dorothy Dandridge was nominated for Best Actress for, which marked the first time that a Black actress was nominated in the Best Actress category. Uh, three weeks from tonight, we've got uh, Victor Poutigny on um, Bonjour Tristesse. Victor is in the audience now, too, so I think I just screw up people's names when they're listening to me say their names. Um, but Victor's going to speak about Bonjour Tristesse, uh, which, among other things, um, was the movie that Jean-Luc Godard 
um, kind of took to and cast Gene Seberg and Breathless because of. Um, Gene Seberg had previously been in the premature film St. Joan, but St. Joan is not very good. Um, and then the final auto premature event um, is Robert Garrick, who is an attorney and a cinephile who St. Louisans probably know because he does a lot of speaking events with Cinema St. Louis, um, but he's going to talk about Anatomy of a Murder, the great courtroom procedural. So it'd be great to have a lawyer cinephile on hand for that. Um, a couple of last thoughts. One is um, if you missed any of our prior events or you want to maybe rewatch this one um, later, we do have a YouTube channel. If you search for us on YouTube, it's just Webster University Film Series, you'll find all of our previous events. Um, there's about a week lag between when the events are recorded and when they go on YouTube. Um, so it won't appear immediately if you do want to rewatch tonight. Um, but yeah, keep an eye on us on YouTube and this video will pop up and you'll also see the other ones in the archive. And uh, lastly, during Justin's presentation, um, his presentation will last in the neighborhood of a half an hour. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll open up the floor for like a Q&A discussion with the audience. Um, if at any time during the presentation, you want to put questions in the Q&A box, please do feel free. Um, and then I'll relay them to Justin when his presentation is over. Uh, but don't feel like you need to wait to the end of the presentation to do it. Um, I'm kind of a passing anime fan. I like anime and I seek it out when I can, but I'm by no means an expert. And it's such a big field. You kind of have to put more time into it than what I do to know much of anything at all about it. So I'm guessing that the smart anime questions are gonna come from the audience and not from me. Um, so again, please don't be shy about, um, in the Q&A box is preferable. You can also put them in the chat if for some reason you prefer the chat. Um, and yeah, that said, I need to get out of the way for our featured speaker. Um, so Justin has a very long um, anime resume. Um, I said on Twitter today that he was the last person to conduct an English language interview with Satoshi Kon, which is true. You're also the founder of Anime News Network, uh, which is true. Um, you're currently the CEO of Media OCD, uh, which maybe we'll hear a little bit about your restoration process and um, uh, putting out Blu-rays and things like that. We were talking about it in the lead up for those of you that logged on early. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it's a very impressive bio and I'm very grateful to have you. And with that, I'll get out of the way and let you actually um, say things that are a lot more interesting than what I have to say. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm uh, Justin Svekas, as uh, Pete mentioned. I've uh, been in the anime industry for 23 years. Uh, I am currently the CEO of Media OCD, which is a uh, production company that specializes in the um, re-release of uh, classic anime on Blu-ray uh, in North America and Europe. Uh, we work with publishers like Discotech Media, uh, Anime Limited, uh, and we've done a few for other companies as well. Um, and uh, having been in the anime business for 23 years, I've gotten to know a lot of uh, interesting, colorful people from both the U.S. side of the business and the Japanese side of the business. and. Um, one of the people that I am very lucky enough to have met uh, years ago, uh, obviously when he was alive, was Satoshi Kon. Um, Kon is a guy that everyone who was an anime fan in North America knew immediately we had something special here. Uh, and the people that worked with him in the anime industry in Japan uh, were emphatic. He was obviously, you know, th this amazing talent. But in Japan, niche at best. He was uh, not anywhere near as celebrated there as he is here. Um, and I think that speaks to what kind of uh, what kind of films he made and what kind of filmography he had. Uh, his films are challenging. They don't fall neatly within any of the pre-existing uh, genres or um, tropes that anime tends to fall into. Uh, most of his films don't even play as a straight line narrative. They play a lot of uh, psychological sleights of hand, a lot of uh, trickery of editing and, and frame matching and things like that. And um, it's the sort of cinema that you have to lean into, which is the whole reason that a film society at a university is having a film series about him. Um, so my first experience with his work was actually something that he did not direct, uh, but he wrote the screenplay for, and that is a film called Memories. Uh, Memories was actually the, it's an anthology film with three different short films uh, directed or created uh, in some cases by Katsuhiro Otomo, the creator of Akira. And 
these were initially supposed to be based on the short stories, but the only one that was actually based on a previously published short story was this segment called Magnetic Rose. Uh, Magnetic Rose, uh, that segment was directed by a really, really talented uh, director named Koji Morimoto, who has been really good friends with, uh, with uh, Otomo for years. But to write the screenplay adaptation and also to do the layout uh, of the film was uh, Otomo brought in this guy, Satoshi Kon. Now, Kon had worked with Otomo a little bit on some earlier works. Uh, he helped out with his films, Rojin Z, uh, which was a uh, kind of satire about uh, caring for the elderly with uh, mechanized hospital beds. And, the, um, and also his attempt at a live action film, World Apartment Horror, which is fun, but nothing special as a film. It's, you know, very, uh, early 90s indie film, uh, Japanese indie film. that It's not, you know, anything you really need to seek out. But Otomo really saw something in Kohn. And so he brought him in to work on, uh, work on the screenplay for Magnetic Rose. And, oh boy, did he rise to the occasion. Kohn was a huge cinephile. And that'll, I'm sure having just watched Paprika, that is very clear to you. Um, but as a result, he thought like a director already at this stage. Uh, he filled his screenplay with camera notes, use this sort of uh, lens, use this sort of focal length, uh, use this sort of racked focus. Um, that sort of screen direction is very seldom in anime screenplays. It's almost never uh, actually in there. It, it's only at the storyboard stage that anime typically introduces things like that. Um, so he filled, he fleshed out the screenplay with a very cinematic eye um, and really ended up adding a lot of things to uh, Magnetic Rose that was not in the original work. Uh, they end up having to introduce whole, like most of the cast had to be reinvented from scratch. Uh, and this is also where Cohn started revealing his technique of uh, that psychological sleight of hand, that, that trick editing where you're not sure which reality you're in and you're not sure what the character believes and what, what, their, what actual reality they're living in. Memories uh, and the Magnetic Rose segment is the first time that appears in film. And uh, it's a thrilling piece. I was actually honored to write the uh, English screenplay adaptation for that earlier, uh, well, actually last year. And uh, we're just bringing out memories uh, for the first time in English, uh, actually at the end of June. Um, and I really got to know that film very well. And that screenplay is so tight. There is not a single word wasted. It's a, it is a masterclass in writing. Uh, I imported memories on Laserdisc, this giant fuzzy box set that cost me uh, a lot of money back then. I was, I was only a teenager, but I, that was the first Laserdisc that I imported uh, from Japan. And boy, did that start a ball rolling. Um, years later, after I, uh, when I moved to New York, there was a, a Satoshi film to greet me, a cone film to meet me. Uh, and that was... I was arriving in New York just in time to see the theatrical release in the States of Perfect Blue. Now, you guys previously covered Perfect Blue. I'm not going to really go too deeply into Perfect Blue. The reason Perfect Blue exists as a Cone film is because Cone was frustrated on Magnetic Rose because Koji Morimoto didn't follow all of his uh, screen directions and didn't do exactly what he was expecting him to do um, when it came time to actually block out all the shots. So he was thinking like, you know, I really want to try this. Um, and it's no, it's no surprise that he was able to make this dream a reality at a studio called Madhouse. Madhouse, if you're not a big anime nerd, is one of the preeminent studios of Japan. It's changed hands over the last uh, couple decades and is not quite the auteur driven place that it was back in the 90s. But back in the 90s, it was run by a guy named Masao Mariyama. And Masao, Mar Masao Mariyama uh, is this um, you know, pleasant old grandpa of a guy. He goes to uh, Otakon a lot, uh, the uh, convention in DC. And he's just this guy that really 
is interested in directors as artists and really tries to build a fire under them and see what what they can do. And uh, he has found some amazing uh, directorial talent. Cohn was probably his crowning achievement. He found Cohn and he had this project Perfect Blue. And he's like, hey, here's this book. If you want to adapt it, we're going to make it a direct-to-video, um, what they call back then uh, OVA, which is uh, basically direct-to-video episodes. Usually they ran anywhere from one to six episodes. Um, sometimes they're just movies that they released uh, direct-to-home video. and they didn't have to sell very many copies because what they would do is they would mostly sell them to Japanese video rental places. And, you know, at, at, was it, uh, 80 to 120 bucks a pop, uh, us, they only had to sell like 5,000 copies and they'd break even on the production. Uh, so it was the OVA market was a really interesting place to test new talent in a relatively, um, risk-free environment. So, younger directors just kind of got to run wild and got to do whatever they wanted more or less with you know very little adult supervision uh and we got a lot of crap back then but we got some really really interesting auteur works now somewhere along the line uh a company called rex entertainment that didn't last very long came in with a little more money and said hey we want to make this a theatrical film but they barely bumped up the budget and uh, Madhouse did what they could, and uh, Cohn did what he could, but Cohn, to be honest, didn't even read the book. He just kind of threw it away. And he made uh, Magnetic Rose his own thing based on the themes that he gleaned from just reading The Dust Jacket. Um, and that is what made Perfect Blue uh, the seminal work of anime history that it is. Um, so from there, you know, we, we got different variations on that. We got, um, Millennium Actress, which is one of my favorite Cohn works. It, it's very sentimental, and uh, but it, it thinks of different novel uses for that uh, that uh, trick of of uh, storytelling that he he loves so much. Then we had a divergence with Tokyo Godfathers, which is easily the most rote and normal of uh, Cohn's films. And then uh, he had a, a TV series, a short TV series called. Um, uh, I'm blanking the name right now. You, you know it already. Um, at any rate, he he did he um, paranoia agent. Thank God. I'm sorry, brain fart. Uh, so paranoia agent was his attempt to do a TV series, and TV series production in anime works very differently than feature films. There's kind of a conveyor belt system where there's like different teams of animation staff, and they all bite off an episode and kind of rotate through them. Uh, and it's really kind of skinny your teeth, barely get it to the TV station on time sort of work. Um, really hard work. And uh, Cohen just wanted to try it. And uh, between Millennium, Millennium Actress and Paranoia Agent, Cohn formed a really tight relationship with one of his favorite musicians. Um, and uh, that, that, um, Pardon me, give me just a second here. Uh, he is, he credits this guy. Uh, anyway, he credits this guy with the imagery for his films. Um, Paprika is a film that is born out of the imagery of this, uh, of this musician. And this mu musician is named Susumu Hirasawa. Susumu Hirasawa is an electronic musician who does uh, lots of strange samples of his voices. He's very kind of stuck in the early 90s as far as uh, his technique. He, I think he still uses Amigas for his, uh, his work. And Hirasawa is a guy who just kind of goes in all these strange directions, does completely unexpected things with very electronic sounding scores. And Cohn found his work just imagery producing. So he would literally just listen to his various uh, Hirasawa uh, records and just draw, just draw constantly. And that, that's uh, where he would come up with this stuff. So they ended up in kind of a strange symbiotic relationship where um, he would throw Hirasawa a bunch of uh, rough 
kind of sketches sort of ideas for scenes that he wanted. And he would have Hirosawa basically do the creative heavy lifting and compose based on that. And then Cohn would go back with those demos that Hirosawa would make and he would write based on that. Um, and uh, it, what can I say? It was very, very fruitful. Although Hirosawa was just like, this is really hard. I have to come up with all this stuff from scratch. Usually film, you know, they, they're scoring to finished picture, but not, not in this case. Uh, so finally, that brings us to Paprika, which is the, the acme of that system. Uh, it's based on a story by uh, Yastaka Tsutsui. And Yastaka Tsutsui is better known by anime fans as the creator of The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. And he, he was actually quite a famous um, author by this time, but also a big fan of Cone. And he was really excited to have his work adapted by Cone. And uh, it doesn't follow the original story exactly, but it doesn't deviate too far from it. But the imagery that Cone came up with is completely unique and obviously inspired by uh, Hirosawa uh, and, and his music. Um, so Paprika is also the final form of his, his psychological sleight of hand. The jumping in and out of dreams, the blurring of dreams and reality, uh, that is a theme that ties in very much both with Cohn's love of cinema and Cohn's whole, you know, psychological sleight of hand gimmick. Now, the idea of movies being equal to dreams or kind of on the same plane as dreams is not a new one. In fact, from the earliest days of cinema, you had the, the whole concept of the perfect movie being 90 minutes because that's around how long a REM cycle is. Um, and uh, if you look at the films he specifically references in Paprika, they're all very golden age Hollywood populist entertainment. Uh, they're, they're, you know, Greatest Show on Earth, which was basically, you know, there is a plot, yes, but it was really just to showcase a bunch of really cool circus acts. Uh, there was Roman Holiday, which is, you know, a delight of a movie, but it's, um, it, it's basically, you know, paper thin, watch Audrey Hepburn be cute. Uh, in terms of story, it, it's just this pleasant diversion. Uh, From Russia with Love, the James Bond film, that's referenced and that's also, you know, it, it's a James Bond film, it's fun. Um, great, great art. It's not exactly art house cinema, although you could make the argument either way as to how, how artsy it is. Uh, and then there's um, Tarzan the Ape Man, or we, it's hard to tell exactly which Tarzan he's referencing. It was probably Tarzan the Ape Man from the, from the 30s. Um, and, you know, that, that's, you know, literally pulp fiction. So they're not art house films he's referencing. He's referencing films that are considered classics now, but were, are very easily digestible and just kind of stick in your brain because they're fun. Um, which is funny because they're way more populist than, than Cone's film output, uh, frankly. Um, so that is what he kind of equates with, with dreams. Now, obviously the lead, uh, lead uh, character, the detective, um, not really the lead character, but uh, Detective Konakawa is a film buff and he has a film background. So of course he would, he would probably have studied those films but those are what, I just think it's interesting that that's uh, what Cone used as his jumping off point uh, but, uh, to bridge the gap between movies and dreams. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the DC Mini, the uh, little device that goes around the ear that uh, captures the dreams and feeds it into a laptop. Uh, really looks very much like an Apple uh, Jonathan Ive design, uh, design device of the era. Um, it, What's interesting about that is it doesn't, well, first of all, it looks nothing like a prototype device at all. Prototype devices are like messy <laughs> wads of wire and circuit boards. It's certainly not this very sleek looking uh, designery mini unit like that. Um, but the important thing here is that Apple's design aesthetic of the era and Jonathan Ives' aesthetic of the era was all about human approachability. Uh, 
devices that looked friendly, that looked innocuous. And you saw other films like Wally, -E, probably being the most famous example, also using that jumping off device to make something that um, humans would interact with without a second thought. It, it doesn't look foreign or scary or anything. It just looks like, uh, oh, you know, here's here, here are my ear pods uh, or AirPods rather. Um, just kind of blobby and white and uh, easy, uh, easy to use. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Dr. Chiba, uh, Dr. Atsuko Chiba, obviously the main character. She is, um, there, there's a duality about her, obviously. There's uh, Dr. Chiba herself, who's this, you know, cold, reasoned voice of science who, uh, you know, she she's very scientific. She doesn't let any emotions through. Um, and uh, she really thinks of humans as a tool to develop her DC mini. Paprika, her alter ego, is unrestrained joy and love. Uh, she's uh, what Brene Brown, uh, Dr. Brene Brown refers to as wholehearted. Uh, she is very open, charismatic. Uh, she loves people um, and is just kind of this joy to be around. One of, one of my first reactions for the film, and I thought I was I thought I was going crazy, but it turns out that it was kind of common, was watching that opening montage with Paprika jumping around the city uh, with Susumi Hirasawa's uh, music. It just, it overwhelms you with happy to the point where I was in tears. And I asked some of my friends, especially ones who aren't uh, as big into anime as I am, and they're like, yes, that happened. I thought I was losing my mind, but it, it's not like a normal happy. It's kind of like this intense gritted teeth happy that we don't know what to do with, which kind of goes along very well with the rest of the film thematically. Um, but anyway, Dr. Chiba and Paprika are the yin and yang that is the thread of Japanese society, which is honne and tatemae. Uh, honne is what you're thinking in, internally, and tatemae is the surface. It's what you, uh, the, the face that you show people. And uh, Japanese society is very rooted in that, in those two things being very sectioned off. Um, I think it's a very interesting thing, and perhaps the theme of the film that uh, the happy ending is that those two blur together, that uh, Dr. Chiba is um, able to connect and able to confess her, her love for uh, her coworker, Dr. Uh, Tokita. Um, she's able to show emotion. Um, and that's, that, that's something that uh, I think, uh, Japanese society can be a little cold sometimes and, and in a professional environment, you don't get to show that side of yourself very often. Uh, I think it was very interesting that uh, that is the note that that Cone decided to go out with there. That, that seems to be the societal uh, statement he was making at this film, to me anyway. Um, as I mentioned, I, I, I met Cone uh, twice and um, he, okay, so I've met a few anime creators over, over my many years in the business. And anime creators tend to fall into one of two categories, personality-wise. They tend to be really kind of quiet and nebbishy and, you know, a little, little hesitant. Or they tend to be a little outgoing. Um, anime directors are not really like American or any... Uh, live action director for that matter, in that their main role is wrangling people. Uh, they're like, oh, this shot would play really well into this artist's uh, sensibilities uh, and what he likes. So let, let, let me assign this, this cut to this artist. Um, that is one of the main roles of, a, of an anime director. Um, so it's always interesting to me to see that uh, a lot of anime directors, the auteurs, um, they have a confidence to them. They have a bravado. They have, um, they're socially out of everyone in the anime ecosystem, which frankly does attract some socially awkward people. They tend to be 
the more social types of them. Um, Cohen fit into a third category uh, who I would probably most closely relate him to uh, Miyazaki uh, in that he could, he could be a little prickly. Uh, he was not the friendliest guy. Um, he was very happy to, you know, talk about his films and give an interview and, you know, give an introduction speech or whatever. Um, but he was all about his films. He was all about putting everything he had into his work and everything else be damned and apparently including his own health, unfortunately. Um, I remember very strongly, we had him in uh, New York City for Big Apple Anime Fest. Uh, and that, that was the reason, one of the, one, one of the reasons he came out. And uh, we were having an autograph signing and the home video release of, of um, Millennium Actress had just come out from DreamWorks not that long ago. So DreamWorks happily sent us, you know, a big stack of uh, one sheets and postcards that we could use for autographs. Uh, and Cone sat down at his autograph session, took one look at him and said, I'm not signing that. That's not Chiyoko. That's some, you know, crap art that some, you know, American at DreamWorks uh, decided to make. That's not my Chiyoko. I get that away from me. Um, so I'm like, okay. Uh, I wasn't there for that particular episode, but uh, there was some minor commotion caused as uh, everyone waiting in line to get their autograph uh, had to kind of scramble to find a DVD to buy or something. Um, so that that was that was a, a thing. But he was very steadfast about that. He had that approach with everything. Um, that encounter was. Uh, interesting because what the real reason he was there was for the world premiere of Tokyo Godfathers and I was the MC for that and uh, that was kind of a disaster um, so Tokyo Godfather we had the screening for Big Apple Anime Fest our screening rooms were in a, uh, a Lowe's theater that was underneath the giant virgin megastore in Times Square um, and uh, long gone all, all of those things but um, so Virgin Megastore was this basically three-story complex of uh, movies and music uh, retail. And then uh, at the very bottom level was a, uh, a small movie theater that didn't get a lot of foot traffic, maybe because it was three stories underground, but uh, it was nice because A, cell phones didn't work down there, and B, um, you know, you could usually count on having the whole theater to yourself, and they end up playing Bollywood movies a lot. Anyway, we... Um, we sent over, we, we got the film print and literally the film had just been finished two weeks, uh, two weeks earlier. So uh, we bring the guy, we bring the film cans and mind you, these are like the giant, you know, 60 pound canisters of uh, 35 millimeter film. We bring it to the projectionist, the projectionist splice it together on the giant reels or the giant platters they had back in the day. Um, Here's the thing, Japan didn't use those platters. They just switched from two different projectors in a movie theater back then. And the way that it would know to switch at the end of a reel was there was this little metallic sticker uh, at the end of each reel and there'd be a, a sensor that it would trip and the sensor would go, oh, it's the end of the reel. Let's switch to the other projector and it, it would make the changeover. Um, in America, with the platter system, there was no need for that because this film was all sliced into one big platter. So that little metallic sticker meant it was the end of the show, turn the bulb off and bring the house lights up. So um, the projectionist didn't know to look at the look for those stickers. And that was a problem um, because that meant that every 20 minutes as the reel would change from you know the first one to the second one, second one to the third one on the platter, those strips went by the head and it turned off the projector and turned off the house lights, but the film was still rolling and you could hear the film, you could hear the soundtrack go by. And I had to like panic to run back there, find the projections, get them back in the booth, get them to turn the, uh, the bulb back on and bring the house lights down and let the film continue. Um, so this happened six times during the course of the film, and it was just the worst way to watch a film. The, the executives from Sony Pictures Entertainment were freaking out, and, I'm like, and they're like, rewind it. And I'm like, I can't. It's a platter. You have to destroy the film. 
So after all this, I had to go up and sheepishly interview Cone for the 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 uh, the audience, which was very happy to be there, but everyone was disappointed. And I get up there and I'm like, so what was the best and worst part about making this film? And he was like, well, the best part is being here to share it with you all today. The worst part is being here for the screening. And I just sank in my chair and went, fuck. Um, so yeah, that that's um, that, that was my uh, Satoshi Kono story. So a few years later, he was back in New York uh, to do promotion for Paprika and uh, Anime News Network, who I was working for again at the time, uh, sent me to do uh, the interview with him. And I was, I was overjoyed to. And uh, I noticed the guy from the public, head of publicity from uh, Sony Pictures, uh, I think it was Fritz Friedman, um, was there with him. And I, I said, hey, uh, Fritz, and he was like, yeah, good to see you. And I'm like, so yeah, do you remember I was the MC for the Tokyo Godfathers premiere? And, and Fritz was like, yeah, don't remind him about that. I'm like, noted. So um, again, kind of a, he, he was happy to answer all my questions. He was very polite, but um, I asked him about what he thought of the release for, uh, for Millennium Actress, and he was very bitter about the treatment that I got from DreamWorks Pictures. And uh, he actually, when talking about that, the release it got and what little promotion they did, he actually used the, the expression Fusakerina, which if you don't know Japanese, that is that basically translates to fuck those guys. Uh, he was still quite bitter about that. And uh, for that was five, six years later. So you can, you can imagine how seriously uh, he was taking all this stuff. Um, he, um, you know, he didn't give up, give off really warm vibes or anything, but he was, um, you know, he was, he was nice and he answered all my questions. His last film that never got finished, uh, The Dreaming Machine, we learned a little bit more about his process because unfortunately he passed away while it was still deep in production. And even though there was a script written and there was storyboards uh, that the whole rest of the staff had access to, nobody was able to finish that film because that whole psychological sleight of hand uh, that he was known for, and this film used it, only Cone knew how the pieces of the puzzle fit together. Uh, only Cone knew how it was going to look in the end. So ultimately, uh, Mariama son, you know, at Madhouse, he tried for 10 years to raise the funds and find another director. And he ultimately gave up because it, like this film died with Cone. Uh, it was Cone's dying wish that uh, somebody finished the film, but ultimately nobody could uh, because it's um, it just, you couldn't, you couldn't uh, figure out how, how it was all supposed to put together, which is the biggest tragedy, ultimately. Um, I mean, aside from Cone passing at the ludicrously young age that he did. Um, but uh, yeah, that is, uh, Paprika ended up being the last film that Cone gave us. And uh, it's an incredible film. It's got, uh, so much to say about society and human beings and you know the the very peculiar operating system that is the human psyche um i love it to death and it's one of my uh, one of my favorite anime features of all time so uh thank you for listening to me ramble for a half hour about him and about the film and uh i guess now would be a good time to uh answer uh talk, talk a little more openly get some questions going yeah, thank you so much, Justin. And it's great to hear such like firsthand color of what he was like. And I wonder, I don't know, I wonder how many um, like Americans know, I mean, he died so young, he died at 46. Like how many people had yeah. the experience that you had? I, so we're, we're grateful to have someone that can that can weigh in on that front. Oh, thank you. I mean, I, they actually used quotes from my interview in his New York Times obituary written by A.O. Scott. So that, that, horrible that it that I had to that that's that had to happen I'm just like I, I was so so deeply honored that that's still like a career highlight to me 
Well, also, um, there's really only one book length critical study of Cohn in English. It's by Andrew Osman, the British yeah. film critic. But you're the last cited source in that book, too. The last time you cited source, it's you. Yeah. I, I hadn't read that, but I just said, my God. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's not bad. It's um, one thing that that book revealed, there's a fair amount of plot synopsis to it. So there's the synopsis yeah. of all four features, but then also of every episode of Paranoia Agent. And Cohn does not lend himself toward plot synopsis. Like, he just seems like gibberish when you read it in somebody else's words. Honestly, I'll be honest, I love Andrew, but I flipped through that book and I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's long out of print now, so good luck anybody. Yeah, I, it, yeah. It, it's fine. But um, one, one other thing I neglected to mention is that... Uh, Cone, yeah, I imagine you, the version you screened was the subtitled version, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so Cone is fairly unique among anime uh, tours in that he hates English dubs. He hates dubs in general. Uh, most anime uh, directors are varying levels of fascinated by it or just kind of like resigned to that exists. Cone outright did not like them. Um, the uh, he 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 said in one of my interviews, I forget which is like, look, if you want, if you see Silence of the Lambs and Jodie Foster opens her mouth, you expect to hear Jodie Foster. Uh, my my choices for actors, actors and actresses, and their and uh, how they present their lines, that's as part of my film as as you know Jodie Foster's voices in in Silence of the Lambs. You show them the same respect I'd expect to be shown that respect, even though I make animation. Um, I thought that was that was an interesting take and also really showed how serious the guy was. That was always, I I don't know, you can imagine I'm a purist with live action films. With animation, I was willing to put up with English dubs until sort of recently. And the thing that broke it with me was comparing the English dubs versus the uh, Japanese subs of Miyazaki's films, because the, the Disney dubs tended to be so different. But that's probably a discussion for another time. Miyazaki, well, we <laughs> don't open up that worm. Yeah, hole. no, that, that's a that's a <laughs> that's a worm can. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'll I'll go to some questions from the audience, and I have a handful of my own too. Um, the first question is from Charles Jacobson, which is actually fairly similar to one of my own questions. So I'll ask his first, and then follow up with mine. Um, Charles wants to know um, how many Blade Runner references are in the film. Um. Honestly, I'm not the biggest Blade Runner aficionado, so may maybe I just wasn't looking for them. Blade Runner is constantly referenced in, in anime, but it tends to be older sci-fi cyberpunk anime. Um, in fact, uh, Bubblegum Crisis, the uh, very well-regarded uh, cyberpunk OVA series from the late 80s, um, the, it, it, you know, lifts imagery wholesale from... from uh, uh, from that, so from all, all, the whole the whole Blade Runner type of thing, and all, also you know Neuromancer and all those, um, but uh, I wasn't really looking for Blade Runner in, in Cone stuff, and I, I'm someone who's a little more Blade Runner. -y can answer that one, I think. <laughs> yeah, Blade Runner does have some some super fans. I mean, if any of you in the audience are have have input on that front, you can put it in the chat. Um, my own question, like I said, that was sort of related is um, you talked about Cone cinephilia, and it's come up in previous discussions too, um, most especially with Millennium Actress. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, like you talked about how like in, you see both posters, but then also references to, you know, Tarzan and Roman Holiday. Um, there's also, you know, Busby Berkeley, you talked about Greatest Show on Earth. Yeah. Um, but at what point, do you have thoughts on like at what point you're reaching? Um, and when I say you, I mean like the royal you, not you personally, sure. um, but like, you know, I feel like I see Fellini in his films. I think as here it's like the circus element. I've always felt like I saw, I've seen Charlie Kaufman in it, um, largely because Kaufman, um, he has such a tendency to have like chases through um, characters' psyches. He does that in Being John Malkovich. He does it in Eternal Sunshine of Spotless Mind. Here Cone does it in all of his films, but Tokyo Godfathers. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so do you have thoughts on like how much you should assume Cone's probably referencing something and how much he's just like, oh, I'm probably trying to find things that aren't actually there? Well, it's it's really hard to draw that line, isn't it? Because you know, also you have to remember that they were contemporaries, so they were probably watching the same films. Um, what films per se? I couldn't say. Um, now, uh, obvious, obviously, you have uh, directors like Aronofsky who literally bought the rights to Perfect Blue so he could, you know, re remake certain scenes, um, and you. Paprika, I don't think anyone could do in live action. I think it's just too crazy. Uh, no one would take it seriously. But um, lots of American directors love 
Cohn's films and they, they reference them a lot. As far as what Cohn was watching to specifically pick up on the you know journey through the psyche films, I, we can only guess. You know, I, I've never seen references directly to uh, to anything like that. What about like The Shining, for example? Andrew Osmond brings that up in relation to Paprika. Do you think that's reaching or do you think that's Cohn? <sighs> Honestly, <laughs> I, we will never know. We'll never know, will we? Um, there is a lot of, you could definitely point to some things that say, hey, that looks like something that I made, might have picked up from The Shining. But also a guy like Cohn had seen so many films, he might not even know himself. He could have just like, it, it that, you know, a particular angle or, or shot could have been rattling around in his brain. That's just what came out on the storyboard and he didn't connect the dots himself. That that sort of thing happens all the time with, with artists like that, especially guys like Cohn who would literally just spend months and months just pen to paper with uh, with um, uh, Hirasawa's music playing, uh, just trying to, uh, try, trying to uh, get out this film that's rattling around in his head, who knows where the imagery came from. So, you know, it, it's one of those things that I, I think is important to ponder, but I don't necessarily think is important to answer definitively, you know? Right. Well, of course, to that point, too, um, it's a minor plot point of the 400 blows that Antoine Gwinnell accidentally plagiarizes something just because he liked it a lot. Yeah. Um, so that's, it's, yeah, it's a known, it's a known phenomenon. Totally. Yeah. So um, Lydia Creech wants to know, um, can you talk about how anime films break out of Japanese markets and hit big in North America? Since Kon was still in your words niche in Japan, what made him such a crossover hit? Uh, in a word, perfect blue. I guess that's two words. Um, so perfect blue was the, the, the thing, perfect blue was just kind of the perfect release for North America at the perfect time. Um, it got a, you know, perfunctory, uh, theatrical release in Japan, and then it went to went to video, and you know it had fans. I don't want to say it was a failure, but it was a niche film. Uh, it wasn't what that market was looking for at the time. Anime in North America, when it hit in '99, was it was still very much emerging from this place where anime was thought of as like this, you know, stuff for edge lords. You know, you had you had like it was a lot of it was really dark and violent. A lot of it was really, you know, sexy. There was a ton of rape. Um, and, you know, obviously there was a hentai, which, you know, that's a whole other thing. Um, but as a result, anime was thought of as like dark and edgy late night entertainment. So um, Manga Video, who released it in North America, was very marketing savvy. The guys that that ran it were, uh, were ex-Island Records people. Uh, and they knew that they had something really good and they were able to really capitalize on the, the kind of grungy cool factor of anime at the time, uh, the, and also kind of play up the fact that we're releasing it in theaters unrated, but we had to make cuts to get an R for blockbuster video. Um, that I think got people's attention because people were kind of looking for the next Akira at the time. And uh, they had thought they had found it a few years earlier with Ghost in the Shell, but Ghost in the Shell was just too cerebral and slow and weird. Um, but Perfect Blue was a thriller. And it was a really good thriller that anyone who had any appreciation for cinema could really get behind. Uh, and it was dark as hell. So it basically perfectly fulfilled audience expectations for really, really good anime at the time it came out. And those expectations have changed over the years as anime is mainstreamed in North America. Uh, but that was the expectation at the time. And it was just the perfect film at that moment. Uh, and from there, people knew the name Satoshi Kon. But um, it wasn't until Sony Pictures really got behind Paprika that we saw any of his films saw the numbers that, uh, that um, Perfect Blue did. I actually don't know uh, Cone's um, release history in St. Louis specifically, but I do, I worked as a film critic when Paprika came out, but it played at the Tivoli here in town for a little while where, you know, like, I feel like most other, aside from Miyazaki, most other um, like animated feature films from Japan were not getting that kind of treatment. But yeah, it's because Sound of Pictures Classics is behind it. Well, um, at, at the time, you know, it was, it's only the last five years or so that we're getting a really decent amount of anime theatrical releases in North America that uh, back then we were lucky to get a couple a year. Uh, sometimes we sometimes we went years without them, um, 
and uh, so yeah, it's pr pretty nifty to, that how far we've come. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I had another question of my own that's sort of related to the one of Lydia's that I just asked. Um, so I read a lot about how a lot of Japanese artists who break through in America, um, they tend to not necessarily be as popular in Japan because they're seen as being too Western. Um, so like Akira Kurosawa is like that, um, yes. Kirsten Murakami is like that. Yep. Satoshi Kon, does he fall in that category as well? Uh, I've never heard it put that way, but I suspect you're right. Um, in, in fact, Tokyo <laughs> Godfathers is literally a Western. Uh, um, so it's uh I, I i suspect that to be the case yes um it, it japan also has a habit of not really appreciating what they have um in terms of like kind of gonzo weird creative artists until the world community points out hey you know you have something special here guys and then they go uh, oh yeah no he's amazing right right uh that that's just kind of what they do you see that that, that even happened with miyazaki um it wasn't until uh they saw that, you know, um, Princess Mononoke was getting at this big theatrical release in, in North America that people were like, oh, right. You had like super hardcore fans that were like, oh, Nausicaa of the Valley of Wind is amazing, but you don't get the, you know, sold out weeks of sold out shows like you, uh, like he did for his last, you know, few movies. That was a, oh, the world is taking notice, we should too sort of thing that happens a lot in Japan. We were just talking about um, how Tokyo Godfathers is literally a Western, um, which I think was a funny answer to my questions. <laughs> um, but it made me think, um, as long as we're talking about literal things, um, I was wondering if you had some thoughts on Paprika as wish fulfillment um, in terms of Paprika herself literally being a manic pixie dream girl. And I think it was before right. that term was coined. Um, but yeah, so how much is it wish fulfillment for its audience? Like, is it intentional that it is? Um, I think it's intentional that Paprika herself is what men hope for uh, and uh, tend to hope for in women in, in terms of like the energy level, the cuteness, the, um, you know, the, uh, the attitude. Um, she is an idealized woman I, just by its very nature and anime kind of that that's anime's trade as, as it were um you know anime and manga culture that's uh you you could look at almost every drawn figure from any you know randomly picked manga or anime on the shelf and you're like oh that person male or female is going to be really hot and they will probably be a certain personality type that is known to make people uh make people salivate um but I think it's unique in that it gives, it roots paprika in a purpose that by its nature is caregiving. Uh, it, I mean, you can almost call her, you know, a nurse of dreams or something like that, a, a wet nurse of dreams even. Um, and uh, so it, on that level, yeah, I think there, there's definitely something to that. Uh, I don't think that it's as unique in anime as it might seem to someone who is, you know, lived and breathed the stuff. Oh, I ought to get that. We're starting to pile of questions to the audience, so I'll try to keep yeah. my own. Uh, yeah, keep, I'll, I'll keep my own for quiet for a while. Um, Drew Edelstein says, how do you feel about the tonal shifts in Paprika? It seems like a movie incredibly focused on blurring lines in every single way. And the most interesting for me is the shifts to absurd body horror mixed in with the adventurous energy that much of the movie has. Oh, I love that. I love that. That's my favorite thing about the film, how that like horrifying scene where he, you know, pushes his hand through her. Oh, oh, that's so gross and I love it. Um, so Cohn loved to shock his audience and he would often get carried away with it. Uh, recently, um, we uh, translated a, uh, an interview that is on the new Perfect Blue Blu-rays that um, he talks about the rape scene in, in Perfect Blue and how now he looks back on it and is like, I went too far. That is way over the top. That did not need to be that egregious and shocking and horrifying uh, to make its point. Um, but in the moment, he does kind of have this, this uh, way of getting kind of gleefully getting the audience too hyped up uh to like getting too much of a reaction out of them um 
you saw a similar thing in Paranoia Agent with, frankly, the opening. Uh, you remember the opening sequence of Paranoia Agent where it was like this manic, happy Susumu Hirasawa song with nonsense lyrics um, while people are laughing maniacally with horrors going on around them. Uh, and uh, it's, people asked him about that when it came out and he's like, well, yeah, it's a late night show. I got to wake him up. <laughs> I think it's just like something he liked doing, just getting getting a strong response from the audience. It's it's fun. It was fun for him. I like that, yeah. And I like the, one of my favorite things in cinema is just that feeling of not being safe. Like I like knowing that you're not really, you can't get comfortable with where you are in that film. I mean, frankly, you, you remember when, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the, the guy that did Dead or Alive and-, and uh, Oh, Takashi Miike. Miike, when Miike was huge. Uh, I really, I used to, this is a sick fuck that I am. Sorry, pardon my French. I don't know if you swear at the, in these. Whatever. You are, you are now. Uh, <laughs> so um, I used to sit in the back row of like each of the killer and just my enjoyment would be watching people freak out and leave. I do that in the classroom. Don't worry. <laughs> That's much worse. I'm, I'm sure. Oh, you're probably, you're probably playing a Serbian film in your classes. <laughs> No, I've never gone that far. Okay, good. Um, yeah. <laughs> Not a very good film. Yeah. I've never taught a Mika either, actually. Uh, but I saw an audition at midnight at the Tivoli, and the, uh, when the movie was over, there was an ambulance outside because somebody passed out and they had to cart him away. Yeah, so can, can, if, we, if I can digress for a second. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I was friends with uh, the company that released uh, a lot of his films here, uh, Media Blasters. Mm -hmm. And um, so they submitted his film Visitor Q, uh, for an MPAA rating. This, I've never heard of this happening before or since. The MPAA sent it back with a post-it that said, this is the worst thing that we have ever seen. Do not resubmit. Rating denied. <laughs> Terrific. And I like Visitor Q, too. I, I do, think too. That's one of his better ones, yeah. I, I, I love that film. It's yeah. horrible, but I love it. It seems like there's that Kirby Dick documentary, this film is not yet rated. He should have addressed mm. that issue in that film. They're still very bitter about that over there, by the way. <laughs> the, the, if you ever need to brown nose them, the best way to brown nose them is to talk about how unfair that movie was. Yeah, yeah. I kind of, maybe I'll bring you back for a Takashi Miike discussion because I want to ask more questions, but I should probably go back to Cohen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the next one, uh, Jessica asks, Paprika features hints of dreaming machine here and there in the dialogue and in the imagery. Do you know anything about how connected the dreaming machine world and the characters were supposed to be to the Paprika universe? Well, I don't know a lot about dreaming machine. He said it was a family film uh, and a lot of the uh, characters were anthropomorphic robots uh, and it was vaguely sci-fi. Um, beyond that, I know nothing. Yeah, the the, uh, the full <laughs> synopsis has never been released, probably because most nobody knows what it was supposed to be. And you know, even if you could, it, it, it would still suffer from trying to synopsize cone syndrome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll just we'll move right along then. <laughs> yeah. um, so Ethan Hawker says. Much is made of how Cohen found influence from the world of live action film, but do you have any thoughts or knowledge regarding how he was influenced by other animators and manga artists? Uh, well, obviously, um, Otomo was a huge influence on him. Uh, he actually, he started off, uh, he actually went to school to be an illustrator. Uh, he just wanted to draw. Um, so yeah, he was, he was uh, reading a lot of manga, obviously the, the great, you know, Japanese works, the Tezuka's, the, the uh, Ishinomori's uh, uh, and all that. Um, also Mobius and, you know, th there's a lot of, um, you know how when you study film in film school, you get a lot of the same directors that, you know, come up in every film class, your Fellini's, your, uh, you know, your, um, you fill in the blanks, you do this more than I do. Uh, um, Wells, Eisenstein. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, Hitchcock, et cetera. Yeah, it's the, same, it's the same well of like 20 directors that every film uh, professor tends to pull from for the most, for their perfunctory classes anyway. Um, and uh, Cohen probably got a lot of that. He hasn't really talked in the interviews that I've read much about uh, his direct influences that way. He tends to talk a lot more about movies. Um, maybe because all these interviews are about his movie work. 
we're at time. Um, do you want to do a couple more questions or do you sure, need to go I, I got time. Okay, um, I'll try to keep it short, just a few more. Okay. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about the character animation of Dr. Tokita, because um, I feel mm. like he's drawn, I, um, from the commentary track, if nowhere else you learn that um, the animators tackle Japanese animated feature films scene by scene and not character by character, like how they would in America. Actually so shot by shot, not even scene by scene. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like Tokita's drawn quite a bit different from all the other characters and not just that he's bigger, um, but he does, I feel like his characterization's very complex and that he's both like grotesque, but also very endearing. Like the scene comes to mind where he keeps raising his hand when the food order is coming, that everything is for him. Um, but yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about his character animation, what you think they were going for, what they were trying to achieve. Well, he's cartoonier. Um, the thing is, uh, all right, so I, I try not to make broad statements about Japanese society when I do these things, but this is actually true. Japan doesn't treat overweight people super well. Um, there are, you know, the, the old, you know, late night show sort of things that you'd see in the 80s and 90s, they still, you know, it, it's still common and it's still kind of seen if you're, if you're a big person that a sign that you let yourself go and you're, you're you know, a disappointment somehow. Um, so if you see a guy that big in Japanese media, it's almost, it's almost a, foregone conclusion that it's just going to be a whole lot of fat jokes. That's just the audience expectation and Cone just kind of played into that. Um, to wit, they gave him kind of like a, almost a Looney Tunes kind of delivery where they they animated more on ones with him. Uh, his motion is smoother and his his facial motion uh, motions are more articulated, but it's often in kind of a Bugs Bunny sort of way, if you notice. Um, it, it's, it's clearly like it's endearing and cherubic and childlike, but at the same time, it's like, <laughs> look at this fat out. Um, so look, I, it doesn't, the, the film doesn't treat gay people much better, uh, but it's not, I, I don't personally, I mean, everyone's level is different and mine is probably a little too high, but I don't, it doesn't raise to the level of problematic for me, but it's, it's a little bit, eh, I don't know. Uh, and I think that's largely because he, he, they're trying to straddle a very delicate line here where it's between someone that the protag that has to be taken seriously enough that the protagonist sees him as a love interest and at the same time is someone that the audience needs to find funny uh, and like kind of comic relief almost. Um, I, th I think Cone was kind of working with the character descriptions that were in Tsutsui's book and just kind of leaning into uh, what he thought the audience would, would uh, connect to. We have a pile of comments, not so much questions. I'll read them out. And if you have anything that you want to add or clarify, feel free. Uh, Charles Jacobson says, I'll try a few BR refs. One, there are so many weird billboards. Two, a detective that doesn't do much detecting. Three, a detective in love with a dynamite non-human. And four, a recursive urban street scene. And then Lydia Creech responds to Carol's, there's also the welcome home sequence where they break into Himura's apartment with all the dolls. Okay, that, that's funny. Uh, so <laughs> until Lydia's comment, I was just like, yeah, but that's Japan. Uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, to be fair, Blade Runner was inspired by Tokyo. So, you know, that's just Japanese. Yeah, there are a lot of weird billboards everywhere in Tokyo. There are, um, you know, and detectives that don't do much detecting, that's just film noir. <laughs> uh, but Lydia's comment, that, that actually is like, oh, oh, maybe you do have something there. Oh. <laughs> he actually does name check Blade Runner on the commentary track. Um, it's does the he? one, yeah, he comes out and says like, that was a, a, I forget which part it was, but he says it is deliberately from Blade Runner. Oh, but interesting, okay. He yeah, I, one time, yeah. I, uh, I did not rewatch the commentary track for this. I probably should have, but you, if if you've seen it, then, you know, you know that I didn't need to. I, I'm here for I'm here for the other stuff, the stuff that you couldn't get on the commentary. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, another comment, this one from Jessica. Khan obviously explores the connection between movies and dreams over and over in Paprika, but he also touches on the connection between dreams and the internet. The fact that he wasn't able to live long enough to witness more of the monstrous growth of the technology of the internet makes me sad. I really wonder what he would have what what he would have been inspired to create at this point in our technological history. That is interesting, isn't it? Um, there are 
Uh, do you know of an anime called Serial Experiments Lane? Mm -hmm. Have you seen it? No, um, one of my former students gave it to me like three years ago and I haven't watched it yet. So I own it. But yeah, I you should it. pop that one in. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> it, I mean, it was it was made in the late 90s. Uh, so it, the whole idea of people's whole lives getting, you know, immersed into these into online worlds and it becoming their reality was a very new and unique thing. And that that show got it right. It, it's terrifyingly accurate. I've got one more question of my own. If anybody in the audience has a, a last minute burning question, go ahead and type it in now or forever hold your peace. Um, my last question, presumably, is um, I was wondering, so Cone does this in all of his films, but kind of ever more so in each subsequent feature to where the frame is just packed with stuff. He's got so much stuff in there, especially in the dream sequences in this one. Yeah. But you know, like the frogs and the Russian nesting dolls and all that stuff. I, I refer to that as the parade of crap. Yeah, the parade of crap. That's like yeah. your, your Twitter handle. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm at World of Crap, by the way, on Twitter, if you want to. <laughs> yeah. um, but so I was wondering how much we ought to or need to or can unpack those things. Like, is Cohn expecting us to kind of go through piece by piece and work through it for symbolism? Or is it just there for like visual interest? Um, like, how important is each individual piece of this? You know, that's a question I've pondered myself a lot. You know, he worked very hard on those designs um but and, and you know obviously everything's in there for a reason there are themes that recur in them however he meant for them intentionally to be obtuse and almost impossible to grok they're the whole concept of the dream world spilling over into reality is that you can't tell what the hell's going on or where what this stuff means or it like people are literally spouting gibberish um like complete word salad gibberish. So to expect to be able to decode uh, obscure visual cues and not even being able to understand what people are saying, I don't think we're meant to really figure that out, but it sure is fun to try. It is. Um, so yeah, I think that wraps us up. Um, we're, we're through the audience questions anyway. Um, so Justin, thanks again so much. We, we've really been uh, lucky to have you. It's, a, it's been a real pleasure. Yeah, I've had a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and everyone come back next week. We'll start with Otto Preminger and Laura. We can talk more about uh, uh, film noir and detectives that don't detect and things like that. Um, oh, yeah, cool. Thanks again, everybody. Take care.